Okay, why don't we, uh, why don't we get started? Um, we're mindful that folks want to make, of course, the fullest use of the remaining warm hours of the afternoon. Um, and uh, we also want to uh, take a little bit more of your time to get your feedback on what you've learned here and um, also what we should do next. Um, we have some uh, narrow and important um, uh, agendas in particular. We want to draw on your help in taking a look at the case studies, taking a look at the modeling results. If you see errors, you see an interesting and important channels for us to work on, please let us know. Uh, let the case study authors, let the modeling team know by email or whatever is efficient uh, for you. But we'd really like to focus on this last session about the bigger picture, about how should we think about the geopolitics of this business, and also what, uh, what should, should scholars who sit in the intersection of academia and policy and business, what should they be doing in this area? What should we be doing as part of the uh, uh, work that we've been doing jointly, the joint uh, program from Stanford and Rice, and also uh, what should be the next phases of work that might happen here, might happen in other institutions? Um, how should we think about uh, the, the next steps? Well, in, in this effort, uh, we are enormously privileged to have some opening remarks from, from uh, two good friends and colleagues who are really in the DNA of this whole uh, joint project. Uh, that the, Their thinking about how energy markets operate uh, has been uh, critical to how I, I think Amy and I have thought about this and critical to uh, our efforts to put together this program really from, from day one. And so uh, what we're going to do is, is have initial comments of 10 minutes or so um, from both of our panelists, and then we're going to rely on, on you, not just to ask questions of our panelists, but to ask questions of each other and to, and to force us to, to revisit some of the key things that have come up over the last uh, day and a half and to, for us to think carefully about what, uh, what we do next. So we're going to um, uh, have these two presentations in the order that they are presented in the program. So first we're going to hear from Jim Jensen. There's Jim's full bio is in your program on page uh, 23. He's originally trained as a chemical engineer. He has an MBA uh, from Harvard University. Uh, in 2001, of, uh, of many of his honors, the International Association for Energy Economics gave him uh, the award as a distinguished professional in this field. Uh, Jim has been watching this business for an awfully long time and has good uh, street sense and excellent uh, uh, analytical sense of what's going on here. And I might add, uh, in addition to that, he is a fabulous dry fly fisherman. Jim Jensen. Thank you, David, and I uh, want to thank Amy as well for <clears throat> the, both of these organizations and the invitations to talk to you. Uh, <clears throat> one of my college professors in engineering used to tell his students, after you've finished your complicated analysis, step back and close one eye. What he's really saying is see if you can rise above the details of what you've been doing and figure out what it's all about. And I think the charge that David and Amy have given us is just that. That's what Ed and I are supposed to try to figure out how to do this afternoon. If I try to look at what we've been talking about, it seems to me we've been exploring the inherent conflict between geopolitics and theoretical economics in a perfect world in which politics did not operate and we had workable markets. What we would essentially see is a system in which <clears throat> the construction of the giant infrastructure that's supposed to deliver all this gas that everybody wants to have would be put together in the most cost, economically efficient way at the lowest cost to the consumer. The trouble is politics continually gets in the way. And so we've been exploring how politics fouls up the works, how it gives us cost solutions that may not be as optimal as we would like, and how it creates situations that in the future may be difficult to deal with. And we'd be using case histories to do that, and obviously melding the two of those is supposed to give us some insights into how to figure out how it's going to develop into the future. Now, basically, if you look at the, at the ga international gas business, it has had its share of geopolitical shocks. The LNG business, for example, uh, we heard Mark talk about the gas battle in Algeria. The gas battle in Algeria at the time that it occurred, and it happened to occur simultaneously with the U.S. 
going through a liberalization of its gas industry and putting in market competition, wanting lower prices when the Algerians wanted higher formula prices, was a disaster. Right after that, the LNG industry, both in liquefaction capacity and tankers, took a 60 percent hit in terms of capacity. In other words, it was operating at 40 percent capacity for a number of years. In the United States, the fallout of that is obvious. Cove Point and Elba Island were closed for more than 20 years and did not function. Now, some of the fallout have, for that has been things like when the Japanese went into the market, they were very careful to make sure they had multiple suppliers, diversify risk. You see the Spaniards, who are sitting very close to Algeria with an extremely weak pipeline link to the continent through France, saying, well, gee, maybe we ought to diversify as well. And what that's done has been one of the stimulus, stimuli to the very large LNG trade that we've seen in Spain. I had experience in looking at the Cove Point re potential renovation in the middle of the 1990s. And Cove Point was saying, if Nigeria comes on and we got a second supplier, we would be willing to invest and bring it online, but we're not going to do it for Algeria alone. But on the other side of the coin, geopolitics has intervened as well. We heard at lunch about the Mexican situation in which supposedly there's a lot of gas there, but it hasn't come about. If you look at LNG projects, you remember that the Bonnie project in Nigeria had a 30-year gestation period. The Venezuelan project has a probably even longer gestation period, and they haven't pulled it off yet. So in effect, geopolitics does enter this equation in ways that are complicated. Now, I've talked about LNG, but in fact, in many ways, pipelines are even more exposed. It's one thing to put in a liquefaction plant in one place, have a ship that goes in international waters and goes to a terminal. If anything goes wrong between source and market, you've got some options. But if you lay a pipeline to somebody that you don't like later on, you've got real problems, and that problem is multiplied in spades when you have essentially transit countries that you've got to go through. And so essentially you look, for example, at the Middle East. In the Middle East, a pipeline to Europe through the Balkans makes a hell of a lot of economic sense. It always has. The problem is you've got a lot of transits to go through, and when you lay out your pipeline routes, you are negotiating transit fees, you're negotiating risk securities with a series of geographic monopolists. They sit in the line that you've got to go through, and therefore, how do you do it? And so, in effect, some of these complicated pipelines never get done at all. And, and I think, to be absolutely honest and blunt, LNG has in part benefited from that, because of, at least you can avoid some of the problems of transit in big pipelines. Of course, there's the other side of the equa equation. If you basically broaden the concept of geopolitics to include the bias towards command and control systems in a world that is evolving towards market economies, you would recognize that the Russians and the Chinese both have inherited that particular background. One of the subjects of late night con cocktail drinking and the people who watch the European gas markets is to ask how many pipelines would have been built from West Siberia to Europe if the Russians had had a market economy. And the answer usually comes out uh, some but certainly not the kind of capacity was put in place because at the time the Russians were doing that, cost was no object. It was a part of the plan. But in fact, pipelines laid are facts in the ground. And once they're laid, they effectively establish how some of the other logistics reshape. And it's very important to understand that. China at the moment is an extremely interesting case because if you look at China and you sort of work the economics of what you want to do, in a non-political world, the ideal thing is to lay a pipeline from the Kovitka field in Irkutsk across Mongolia down to Shanghai, which is the big market. Now, nobody says, said originally that could be done. The east-west pipeline, which leans, links the Tarim Basin in the west to Shanghai in the east, which incidentally is a longer pipeline than we ever built in North America, is the one that they're going to take. And you might have noticed when in uh, Dr. Kudo's presentation the other day, the description of that east, that Northeast Asian pipeline, you notice that the, the pilot pipeline from Irkutsk does not really go through Mongolia anymore. It avoids Mongolia. And of course, the reason for that is that the Mongolians hate the Chinese and love the Russians. And the Chinese decided the best thing to do is to avoid the short route to Shanghai, and they're talking about a route that goes around. So we've essentially got the Chinese with solution, the east to west pipeline, which is costly. And unfortunately, when you look at coal markets in China, they're cheap. If you sort of say, well, let's let the market rule, it's going to be hard to find any buyers who will be willing to do it in the face of coal. 
So in other words, the Chinese geopolitics are creating a logistic system for gas. It will be interesting to see how it works out and how it develops. Uh, <clears throat> taking a look at, on a forward look, uh, what, some of the, what are some of the, the ones that are rattling around that are is issues? We heard some discussions about Bolivia. Uh, <clears throat> Bolivia makes a lot of sense with all that gas to serve the Pacific market, but the Chilean problem is there as long as, as well as other things. You could picture putting a pipeline into Peru and avoiding the Chilean political problem, but that raises costs. Uh, you take a look at India. India is a classic case in point because if you, first of all, one of the problems with LNG is it is essentially coastal. And we forget the fact that in Korea, Taiwan, Japan are coastal societies. All the big cities are on the coast. You put the tanker in there and by gosh, you've served the market. India is not a coastal side. They're co coastal regions, but if you put a series of terminals around India and then you build pipelines to the interior, you've raised the costs of the interior supply. And in a sense, it makes, makes an awful lot of sense to put a pipeline spine down through India and supplement it by stuff coming in by LNG tanker on the coast. But we may not get that solutions because it's got to come from Iran, it's got to come from Afghanistan, it's got to transit Pakistan, and so we may have a solution that is economically suboptimal. Um, I've already mentioned China. It'll be interesting to see how China develops. I mean, I watch China and I am mindful of the fact that under a command and control environment, the Chinese built two pipelines, 300 million a day, which are sort of small, small beer by compared to what they're talking about now. To, from the Ordos Basin to Xi'an and the Ordos Basin to Beijing. Both of them operated well before below capacity because in command and control you can build pipelines, but you can't necessarily build markets. And the interesting question to, to see will be how will the Chinese economy develop? Will it in fact digest the gas that's being put there? If so, what are the implications for the LNG projects? Having said all of that, and I'm probably going to run out of my 10 minutes, it seems to me the challenges are to try to understand these geopolitical pressures and their overlays and how they're going to change what is the theoretical economic solution that the model is trying to seek out. How do we find those modifiers that will change and make the prediction more realistic in terms of geopolitical terms? I was asked to comment a little bit also about uh, risk factors. And let me just simply say, uh, we've heard a lot here about how safe LNG is, and I believe LNG is safe. Uh, I live in Boston, which I must say is at the hotbed of, of safety panic, and so I read the Boston Globe all the time and I get the other point of view. But here we're talking, to, we're talking to the converted, and the people who are not converted are the people who read the Boston Globe. And the question is, what's going to cause them to react and, and to, to do things? And I must say I'm nervous about that. We know in the nuclear situation that we had Three Mile Island, we had Chernobyl, and it really changed the course of nuclear development worldwide. Now, I'm, don't, I'm not forecasting any kind of a disaster in LNG, but I'll say right now, if somebody took one of those planes that took off from Logan Airport and hit the North and South Tower and took it into an LNG tanker in the middle of Boston Harbor, it would be another Chernobyl. Or conversely, if they put it into Ras Lafon, we might see some very big things, which says that in effect, security of that particular link has very profound implications for the system as a whole. I probably used my time up. I'll shut up. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, and I suspect there may be some some uh, comments on your last point, but let's also make sure that um, I'm just anticipating what my good friend and colleague uh, in the front row here may may say. But um, th these are, uh, I think, what Jim reminds us of is that the real outcomes in this business are not only a matter of economics and engineering, but they're also a matter of how uh, this business is perceived. Um, our next speaker, I think it is not an understatement to say that almost all roads of energy policy analysis in this country lead at some point, usually sooner rather than later, through Ed Morse. Um, Ed has had a distinguished career in government uh, with Carter and with the Reagan administrations. Uh, he, for a decade, led Petroleum Intelligence Weekly and um, its sister publications in the petroleum and gas uh, industry. He is now executive advisor at Hess Energy uh, Trading Company, and he is a regular uh, and insightful and uh, articulate and often funny commentator 
uh, on the, the nature of this business, and it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Ed Morse. Thanks for that very nice introduction, David. It's an honor uh, to be a participant. Actually, uh, I'm honored that you keep inviting me to appear at these events. I didn't appear at your first one where you asked me to speak, and I didn't appear at a bunch of Baker Institute conferences. And, um, I'm delighted that you keep asking me back. And I'm also honored to participate in this last panel, um, even though, uh, as both of you know, I don't think this is a field which deserves the term uh, expert commentary because it's not a field in which I think there are any experts. We're all learning uh, about a business that's changing relatively rapidly. And indeed, I'm a bit awed myself at the Herculean effort made by uh, David and Amy and their colleagues at Stanford and the Baker Institute uh, with this project and, uh, and your effort to fill fundamental gaps in our knowledge about the geopolitics of gas. Um, it's really the issue of knowledge that I think I, uh, that Jim and I have been asked to address, and Jim uh, has certainly shared some trenchant observations with you. Um, I think it's fair to say that many of the speakers talked about the role that geopolitics will play uh, in structuring the future of the international gas sector, just as politics and geopolitics have played a profound role up until now. But uh, trying to be concrete about exactly that role is something that it's very difficult. My first set of observations, indeed my, uh, the, most of my observations, come from what I consider to be the first law of politics. And that law briefly stated and much elaborated upon uh, by a person whose name is scarcely mentioned these days, uh, namely Karl Marx, uh, is the slogan, where you stand depends upon where you sit. Um, and unlike Jim, who has a background uh, that is really relevant to this field from both uh, a degree in business and a degree in engineering, uh, I have a background in politics. Uh, and the notion of where you stand depends upon where you sit is to me especially uh, pregnant as a notion. Uh, and that's especially the case when it's linked with uh, what I consider the second law of politics, uh, which is that only God can construct a perfect win-win solution. Um, and I think we'll see that uh, in the course of my remarks because uh, where you stand depends on where you sit means that this is a world in which individual participants pursue self-interest, uh, self-interest that's designed to take advantage of others, to get advantages over others, to increase your freedom, uh, while limiting the freedom of others to increasing market share, while decreasing the market share of others. Uh, if you're a producer, your gain is someone else's loss, whether that's the loss of a competitor or whether it's the loss of a customer. Uh, if you're a buyer, your gain is in price, and that price comes by maximizing what you get at the expense of uh, other potential buyers or, or of those selling to you. That is to say, this is an inherently conflictual world. It's an inherently non-sum environment. Even if win-win solutions are found, uh, someone wins more than uh, another party wins. And I'll uh, note that if you apply this to gas, there's not much unique in the international gas business to what I've said, but rather, uh, if your approach is that of political science, uh, you'll also take the view that there's not likely to be a lot new because politics is a lot like sex. The rules of the game were worked out a very, very long time ago, and we're just looking at variations on a theme. I'd like to make a few more observations uh, based on uh, where you stand depends upon where you sit. Uh, and uh, I'll speak more specifically about the geopolitics of gas in these remarks because where I stand did depend on where I sat. And my experience in the gas business really began uh, at the beginning, in a way, of the internationalization of the gas market uh, at the time that I was in the U.S. government and a time that was strikingly different from the world of today. And uh, from that experience, I'm going to try to make some stark generalizations. Uh, in the kind of time-tested manner of uh, the two professions that I've had. One is as a uh, professional political scientist, to the degree there is such a thing, and the other is as a consultant, uh, namely that I'm going to make some generalizations based on single data points. 
Um, as a uh, former member of the State Department, in fact, the most senior person in the State Department whose full-time responsibility uh, was in the energy business, I had the privilege of participating um, in a number of negotiations uh, that have had a formative experience in my view of this business, uh, even though the world has changed slightly. Um, my first experience came as a uh, U.S. representative participating in negotiations over the price of imported natural gas, uh, negotiations both with the Canadian government and the Mexican government when we were negotiating imports from Mexico. Um, and you might say, you know, was it the U.S. government business to be involved in price setting at the border? And the answer is yes, it was. And the reason it was is that at both of those borders, north and south, there was a a single entity that was setting the price for exports. Uh, and since the single entity was uh, making the price determination at the border and deciding, as was the case on the Canadian side, through differential pricing to maximize uh, the gains of uh, Canada as a whole, uh, in order to deal with that power, a countervailing power was required. Um, and over time, I, I began to believe that uh, as I did with other negotiations in which I was engaged, that there's a considerably greater amount of power on the buy side in the gas business than there is on the sell side. And there's especially more power uh, on the buy side when you're on the buy side in a vibrant marketplace. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, that, uh, that is especially the case for that it is difficult for producers in a highly capital intensive uh, industry uh, to exercise predominant uh, price setting power. Uh, it is a very difficult thing for uh, sellers to do. Uh, I don't know whether my views on this are an artifact of my having lived, as we all have, in a world that has been prone to surplus capacities. Uh, and it certainly has been helped by those surplus capacities. But uh, it is certainly a generalization that I think uh, is borne out by other experiences that I had or that the world has had, and I want to look at a few more of these. I also had the privilege of participating in um, uh, an event that is part of some of the case studies and that Jim just talked about, namely uh, the uh, U.S. government substituting for El Paso natural gas uh, in a series of negotiations with the Algerian government over the price of LNG into, uh, into the U.S. market. Uh, and let me look, as Jim briefly did, at what that dispute was all about, because the dispute was really uh, about not only the ability to set prices, but the nature of that price link. And it was really the crude oil gas link that uh, was taken to the extreme in that contract dispute. Uh, what the Algerians wanted to do more specifically is to move from uh, a loose crude price linkage to a BTU equivalent linkage. Now, you might say that's not so bad, but the problem was that the Algerian government wanted to link the price of natural gas on a BTU equivalent basis at the wellhead with oil rather than at the burner tip, which was the uh, U.S. government uh, position on, uh, the, on that subject. Um, and indeed, over time, uh, the position that the U.S. government took on that is a position that seems to be prevailing in the marketplace. And, and I'll say a, a bit more on, of, on that in a minute or two. The, certainly, as Jim remarked, the failure of those negotiations between the U.S. government and the Algerian government uh, was one of the many acts that sidelined the growth of the LNG business and, and, and framed the, the growth of the LNG business uh, for a 15 to 20 year period of time. The other formative experience I had almost exactly at the same time uh, was related to LNG as well. Uh, and setting aside the economics of it, uh, and indeed I'm still proud to have a t-shirt that bears the sign of what that was all about, which had to do with the Teneco North Star LNG project bringing LNG from Russia to the United States, uh, a project that may not have gotten off the ground, but at least was interrupted by the imposition of sanctions by the U.S. government against, uh, against the Soviet Union. 
Uh, and I say that because uh, we had some discussion yesterday about how uh, the ha infrastructure has developed between bankers and their partners who won't let the spigot be turned on or off for wanton reasons. But we've had in this business wanton reasons, uh, usually uh, wanton reasons that were articulated by the U.S. government. Uh, and it was not only in the case of the Russian LNG business, but uh, a whole litany of other international projects where uh, the wild card has been what Washington has or has not wanted, uh, irrespective of the fallout to that. And I think uh, that there is a lesson in that if we should be too glib about prospects for uh, institutionalization uh, of one or another thing that we're looking at in the international gas business. I will have as a side note on this because uh, memory requires me to say it that uh, I was at the time co-chair of the U.S.-Iranian uh, Energy Working Group. Uh, and uh, we in the U.S. government at that time put incredible pressure on the Iranian government not to go ahead with the Iranian pipeline to Russia that would have swapped Iranian gas with gas in Europe. Uh, and it's a sidebar of note in the history of the geopolitics of this business. I talked a little bit about buying power. Uh, and I want to move from the power of buyers versus sellers in setting price to uh, something that has not been taken into account uh, in the proceedings of this conference or in the outline of uh, the studies and case studies in the, uh, in the joint Baker-Stanford uh, effort. And that has to do uh, with regime construction because uh, one of the striking differences between uh, the international gas world and the international oil world is not simply uh, the uh, difficulties that Amy Jaffe pointed out yesterday uh, in uh, creating a cartel uh, on the seller side, uh, but the more complex sets of interests uh, in trade and investment that exist in the gas chain that don't necessarily exist uh, in the crude oil business, a subject that uh, has been alluded to. Uh, what we have seen over the last half decade, or a little bit longer, uh, has been the emergence of real rules of international trade, flow of product or commodity or material through third parties, uh, and international rules about investment that are really associated with the European Union. Uh, and I think Ira Joseph was quite right in saying that the European market has emerged in a different way from the U.S. market on the other side of the Atlantic Basin or the Asian market. But I think the most telling part of it is that the European hub uh, in the international gas business is really the largest hub. Uh, Europe imports from more diverse sources in more different ways than any other uh, regional uh, area. And Europe has been able to exercise power power of a changing deregulated market to change the relationship between buyer and seller, to change the, the relative position uh, uh, that it has vis-a-vis -vis the major suppliers. And it began, of course, with the way uh, the European Union required Norway to break down its export pricing system and to play by European rules uh, and to allow the equity participants in the Norwegian shelf to sell to whomever they want it uh, on the European continent. Uh, and it made life very difficult for the Norwegian economy and the Norwegian government, unless the Norwegian government acceded to those European demands. We've seen more recently that despite the efforts of the Algerian and Russian governments combined and individually to fight EU rules on such thing as resale of material, uh, that the European Union has basically won out. Uh, and, uh, and there is a very powerful, in my mind, uh, function that's being played in the European Union of setting a, the elements of a global regime of rules of, uh, uh, for oil and gas trade uh, and investment uh, that is not being played out anywhere else in the world and it certainly, certainly does warrant attention. Uh, I have three other short sets of remarks to make before I sit down. Um, Ira, among others, talked about spot market development. And again, I have to re recall 
historical experience because uh, when the U.S. and the Algerian governments were in a, uh, in a dispute with one another over the price of LNG uh, and what that price ought to be, uh, two things happened at the same time. One was we're in the middle of a change of a U.S. administration, uh, which meant that there was nobody really in charge. Uh, and the other was that uh, uh, Roy Huffington had uh, done a deal with the state of Massachusetts, with Senator Kennedy, uh, and with the district gas facility at Everett to bring what would have been the first spot cargo of LNG uh, into, uh, into the United States. And it would have come in, if memory serves me correctly, at a landed price of $3.50 per million BTU of gas at a time when the dispute between the U.S. and Algerian government was over whether that gas ought to be 75 cents per MBTU or $1.25. Um, and for foreign policy reasons, I vetoed that uh, effort and had Senator Kennedy and Roy Huffington uh, uh, yelling at me uh, in, in my office for a long period of time. But uh, uh, since then, arbitrage of the spot market has have, have certainly um, – have certainly uh, uh, emerged. And I say this again based on the notion of where you stand depends on where you sit. In my current uh, professional uh, or commercial uh, role, uh, we are engaged in, uh, in relationships with two producers of LNG, uh, two sovereign producers of LNG, uh, as middlemen. Uh, and, uh, and that's because they don't, dis they don't trust exactly their uh, foreign commercial partners that are integrated firms uh, on a bunch of commercial issues. And uh, what the trust is really about, or distrust is about, is, uh, is exercising the option optionality that, that exists in uh, arbitrage opportunities, spot market opportunities, or marketing opportunities, uh, where uh, the producers recognize that there is optionality uh, in the marketplace and that their uh, integrated company partner is likely to grab that optionality unless they find a way to do it. So there really has been a role in this business for um, middlemen that I think uh, was not anticipated and certainly hasn't been, hasn't been uh, discussed uh, very much at this, at this conference. I have two final sets of issues to allude to. Um, and they don't have to do with politics uh, in the same way that the other remarks that I made have, but rather look at the gas business in ways that are very similar to the oil business. And one of them has to do with uh, uh, the very interesting paper that Martha Alcott uh, gave us yesterday with her case study, because the lessons for her on the gas side are identical to the lessons that one learns about the oil business, where uh, access to markets has been a major problem for landlocked or quasi-landlocked countries uh, in the resource business, where the resource gets stranded um, not because of lack of market, but because of lack of market access. Uh, and there are two elements to supply in this sense that are of concern in this business as they are in, in the oil business, and Jim spoke of them. Transit routes on land and transit routes on sea uh, are real geopolitics, and they do not uh, escape the gas business any more than they escape the oil business. Uh, the final observation has to do uh, with international strategic issues. Certainly we have seen in the European Union concern about uh, security of supply of natural gas uh, and efforts been, that have been uh, suggested by uh, European commissioners and their staffs with respect to uh, flexibility of supply arrangements, and with respect to the creation of uh, emergency stocks that are mandated or emergency stocks that, that are jointly owned. Uh, and in that sense, um, the gas business will turn out probably to be not very different in terms of the problem from the oil business, but very different in terms of the solution because uh, it will be a very long time indeed be before the international gas business is as globalized as the international oil business is. Um, and there is no appropriate mechanism on the horizon or institution on the horizon like the IEA emergency sharing uh, mechanisms uh, or stock requirements. Uh, but I think we will see regional solutions. Uh, 
because the problem of security of supply probably can be managed uh, regionally rather than uh, globally. Um, that's it for my remarks. I think that one other difference that we have seen between the gas side and the oil side uh, is that uh, there's very little talk about uh, the implications of the Hubbard curve uh, in the international gas business. There may be some day, uh, but that's not likely to be the case in the next two to three years. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, both Jim and Ed, for helping us get our eyes refocused on the big picture here. Um, we are interested in the interplay between politics and the economic solutions here, and we are interested one step further in not only getting the story right about a whole series of observations about how politics influenced outcomes, but also ideally being able to say something more systematic about that. That's our ambition here. It's a complicated issue. We're all learning about this. We're uh, all in the steep part of the learning curve. So we invite you now to make comments both on what Ed and Jim have shared with us, but also what's your law of politics? Add to Ed's uh, first two law of laws of politics. What should we be looking at uh, in this study uh, related to geopolitics? Should we be looking more closely at certain regions, the European Union, uh, Iran, China? <clears throat> um, step outside the, some of the details of these individual studies and look at the larger picture and uh, help us in this final session make sure that we, uh, we keep the right compass as, as this work goes forward and as other folks uh, look at this question. James. Yeah, I think we should do the microphone because they're, they're recording all of this. You go to CIA. I didn't even give my permission to that. Um, uh, just uh, I realize that you don't <laughs> want the long speech now, and I'm just going to make some very quick points. First of all, um, on your very last question, what, do you, what should you include, you don't include? Uh, in my view, the, um, the role of ENI and Mr. Mate was mentioned, but Mr. Mate's natural heir, his graduation project, is in my view Petronas. And that's a phenomenon that is totally outside the world that Ed was just talking about but I think is a very significant alternative to how a state company operates. And you could also say, in some ways, Statoil was a precursor. So I think something along the lines of the commercial international state company uh, would be an interesting one. Um, and I don't just mean international trader. Uh, I, and reacting to some things that were said, but particularly brought up just a little while ago, I think it's very important not to confuse micropolitics and geopolitics. Some of Jim's comments, I believe, where he said geopolitics, he really was talking about micropolitics. Uh, and uh, an issue there, just an example, is when a country says that I don't want to export because, or I don't want foreign investors because this compromises my sovereignty, that may have international implications, but they've taken a domestic choice, self-defeating as it is. And I think we mustn't confuse uh, that, those two issues. I think it's important to keep differentiating. A, a, a commercial point, I, I, in putting these statistics, there's an awful lot of loose mention of the word spot. It may be loose in oil, but in gas, do not confuse a genuine spot sale with incremental deliveries under a contractual uh, structure. And I, I think some of the things I saw earlier were sweepingly defining uh, things as spot that are not spot. When the Trinidad partners redirect their cargoes, that's under their contract. That is not a spot delivery to the U.S. Um, and the other thing I, along that, trading is not marketing. <laughs> Traders and brokers do stuff that is different from marketers who place things in, in markets in the hands of users. And I think, again, it's important not to make, to, to make the distinction, not to blur it. Finally, a lot of the people who come from an oil background or look at the politics of oil coming new to gas, I will just warn them of something that I had to learn the hard way uh, 20 years ago, 
uh, in, in gas is not oil. The single biggest mistake is to confuse capacity in oil, which is about production, with capacity in gas and especially LNG, which is about infrastructure. And infrastructure capacity is the big issue in gas and it's the big issue in security. And it's why the geopolitics of pipelines is fundamentally more complicated than the geopolitics of, of LNG. And I would just recommend any day now, a very long gestation uh, work at the IEA under the leadership of Sylvie Corno on gas security is going to come out. And I think it will be the first time that the IEA really, really addresses this issue of gas infrastructure security and gets away from the old definition of security about sources of production, sources of consumption, where you just magically wish the capacity to be there and otherwise ignore it. That's all. Thank you very much, James. Jim or Ed, would you like to comment on I this? I mean, there are a series of comments there. Let me say, first of all, that I see the national oil companies growing in sophistication, and the comment about Petronas is very realistic, and I expect to see more of that. I think you're going to see the national oil companies gradually becoming major international companies in their own right and part of this integrated structure. So I would agree very much with James on that. Uh, his comment about spot markets and, and the, say, the loose way they're often described is also very accurate. In fact, it's very ironic because Sylvie Corno, that you just mentioned, who runs the statistics for the IEA and preceded Marie-Francoise Chabrilly at Cetagas, gets a different set of statistics than Marie-Francoise Chabrolet does at Cetagas because <clears throat> Sylvie takes some of these swaps and treats them as if they're short-term trades or spot trades. Well, marie Francoise are much more rigorous. And I think there are definition problems as to what this is. It's a much more complicated business than it used to be, and you've got to define your terms. Um, you had a number of other comments. That's all I'll say for you. Let me suggest, I, if anyone has a comment related to this issue of what is happening with the former state-owned companies and this uh, new kind of ecosystem, commercial ecosystem that's emerging with, with the uh, Pet Petronas and, and uh, other firms of that kind of structure, as well as the purely private firms, if you have comments on that issue, why don't you step up and make those comments right now, and I'd like to follow that track, and if nobody has a comment, then we'll pick up new round new set of comments. Does anyone have anything they want to say about that issue that we should be paying attention to in the geopolitics? Okay, next question, please. TT uh, Giant. <laughs> oh, wait, I'm sorry. A... Somebody, did, he? did you have a comment on this? Well, yeah, to some extent. Uh, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, the, uh, the issue between Russia and China and the context of this program has been that Russia was going to send their gas to China. Everything I see, I've been involved for 20 years here, uh, it's just the opposite. That, uh, and I think the East-West pipeline may be playing out in that geopolitics. The reason the Chinese are moving that is to Kazakhstan and compete with Russia in Western Kazakhstan because Kartakovsky is in jail for trying to send 400,000 barrels to Da Nang. And there is nothing that tells me that the Russians have any plans at all to supply gas to China. In fact, the Chinese military buildup uh, is of great concern for the Russian government, as is the United States. And the energy supply of China, of where they're going, uh, Sudan, they've been shut out of Kazakhstan already. They've been unsuccessful there in uh, Indonesia. That looks to me like the geopolitics that uh, are not reflected in the comments of the conference. Well, I'm going to just make a brief comment on this and then see if others want to follow on this issue of, of China. I, I think actually West East is step one, along with the LNG facilities in the South, are the early steps of a longer term strategy. And the very next steps, in fact, will be Russian supply uh, into the Chinese uh, uh, system. But do other people have comments on this well, issue? I mean, there have been meetings between heads of state between Russia and China 
voicing a desire to do it politically. So it seems to me that it's a question of, I think the economics aren't very good at the moment, given the market, but it seems to me the, the intent to do it politically is there. Okay. Uh, on this issue of China, okay. Do we have the microphone that moves around? Okay. Sakhalin is selling most of its oil to China. That's happening now. And secondly, the Sakhalin project has made no uh, secret of the fact that it would love to have China as an LNG buyer. And I haven't heard uh, Putin say, not over my dead body, nor have uh, I heard the Chinese say that. So as a simple fact of today, as opposed to what might happen, that's already uh, a fact. Let me suggest, before we go to our very patient next questioner, uh, do other people have comments, especially about the larger question here? The larger question for this study on geopolitics is, should we be doing something different about how we think about China, about how we think about Russia, different from what you've already seen as some of, for example, the model outputs that, that both Peter and Ken have been discussing earlier? Boyko. Uh, Boyko Nates of the Energy Charter. Uh, a brief comment on, on the latest question. All I have to say is look back in time. We are discussing things, 2030, uh, things like this. We've put ourselves in the position to be in 1975 and discuss today. Lots of things can happen, all right? One of the things that I'm sure will happen is there will be a few bumps along the road, just like between 75 and today. If we start counting the big bumps, well, there are more than five, six, seven. The smaller bumps will also be there. And in this context, the real, the real question from my point of view, China, Russia, sooner or later, um, I, I remember discussing the same issue about seven, eight years ago. And at that time, I was, uh, I was nicknamed Dr. Doom because I was very skeptical about, about the whole thing. <clears throat> But eventually, eventually, well, that, that is a possibility. It may happen. What the model is, uh, is missing, um, and that is the reason it is a fairly optimistic model, it projects a growth of 5%, 6%, 7% per year. And, well, um, I was reassured by, by Jim Jensen and, and Morris recently, and before that by Tom Heller, who gave a more pessimistic view of the future. And I tend to also share this, this view. We should take into consideration the uh, regional aspects of geopolitics, like uh, in the case Russia and China, and scale down the, 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 the possibilities, taking into account the risks, and also look in the things which uh, are the basic risk mitigation factors that could help those projects go ahead among those risk mitigation factors, and that was also discussed uh, in a few instances yesterday and today. Well, we have uh, commercial ways, we have uh, contractual ways to do that. The IFIs uh, can help uh, bilateral agreements, uh, multilateral arrangements, a whole range of things, and this, I think, should also be made part of, uh, of the study. And let me just to clarify, you're saying that we should be attentive to the possibility that economic growth in China could be lower than what uh, folks have been looking at, right? Uh, well, right now you don't have, uh, in, in the study, you're heavily skewed towards pure economics. And, well, as, as uh, Ed Morse was saying and um, also Jim Jensen was pointing out, you have to take one way or other account of, uh, of the political factors which uh, scale down often the, the possibilities. Okay, thank you very much. Other, other points on China and Russia? Uh, if not, a, not at something in general, but on Russia and China. You have to just talk to the relationship between great powers and the balance of power within the world. And as in, maybe I can, maybe I can stand corrected, but very little discussion about the massive deployment of American power around the world to protect sea lanes, the massive deployment of American okay. power and alliances in, in places like the Persian Gulf, there's been no discussion of that. And presumably that is what the key elements of what geopolitics are. I think that's a good point. And, and we, we, let's 
we'll, we'll come back to that issue in, in just a second, uh, because I really think that opens up another whole line of discussion. Uh, and, um, is it a meritorious line of discussion? <laughs> it, it, it's, uh, th there is a merit order. It's not exactly the way you dispatch a power plant, but there is a merit order. Uh, for our very patient next questioner, because it looks like there aren't any other questions directly on the issue of Russia and China. Thank you. I knew I should have jumped ahead of James, but I just wasn't quick enough to get you. <laughs> uh, TG Giant from KBR. Uh, Jim Jensen mentioned risk factors, and I, my question to you is, uh, how does the model handle risk factors? What kind of risk factors are in there already? And how easy is it to get uh, specific risk factors into the model? Specifically, I want to uh, ask about um, Alien Tort Claims Act, which Tom Heller brought up. Um, this is, you know, from the little reading I've done on the subject, I know that this can be a huge issue for companies. Uh, the, you know, compared to the, 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 um, uh, the, uh, the amount of, uh, the cost uh, of this problem could be, um, could make the asbestos issue look like pocket change. So uh, unless legislation is brought in to mitigate the effect of this uh, statute, or uh, it just happens to go away for one reason or the other, uh, companies could be facing very serious uh, legal costs. So uh, is this taken into account in the model, or is there a way of handling it uh, easily? Let me ask Peter Hartley to say a couple words about this. And then uh, if Ed and Jim, after that, want to comment on what else should be on our radar screen, that I think would be very useful. Actually, there are a couple of ways you could you can take account of risk factors. One is that, that uh, one can have uh, different uh, required rates of return for projects uh, dependent on the country you know, where they're being developed. So you can, you can add in a, a risk premium that investors would have to earn in order to develop a project in certain countries. Uh, you can also uh, adjust the tax treatment. That's another another way of so there could be sort of expropriation via. via you know, ex post changes in tax rates or whatever, or you can have different differential tax treatment. And then, of course, another thing you can do is uh, we can do is we can um, just say that a, a political situations will mean that certain projects either won't be started or even if they're started, they will be shut down. Sort of an extreme form of, of uh, risk, if you like. Um, so there are a number of ways we can do it. Uh, is it, but I, I sort of uh, think that the, the key thing we want to do here in terms of moving from the case studies and thinking about politics and the economics is to try to distill uh, key principles or, or uh, you know, uh, what, are, what are sort of fundamental lessons you can learn, learn about the way uh, some of these uh, political factors are likely to influence developments. All right, so we all know there's going to be sort of uh, lots of unexpected things that can happen, <laughs> but we want to know uh, what are some of the principles, uh, what are some of the key things uh, that we think might happen. And, yeah. Jim or Ed, do you want to comment on this? Um, <clears throat> I mean, clearly risk has changed, and in my view, risk has increased for LNG projects because the old classic long-term contract written with an ent entity that was either a national monopoly, government monopoly, or a regulated utility, enabled the risk to be spread once the government said yes, the more it becomes a, an integrated project. I think risk has migrated upstream, so companies are looking more at a rate of return commensurate with industrial hurdle rates than they are utility hurdle rates, that being neither here nor there. Now, there are adjust risk adjustment processes being made. You've you follow the international oil business, you know, the oil companies are using mid-cycle prices, which are very much discounted over the prices that you see in the market today, both for oil and gas. Um, you know, $21 a barrel right now in the, in the face of the kinds of prices we see for oil and gas, uh, one of the big companies is creeping up towards $3. Now, what does $6 an MCF mean when the mid-cycle price for decision-making is way below that? There are risk adjustment factors being put into the system. How you accommodate in the model, I don't know. I, I leave that to you, but it's out there, and you've got to recognize that it is there. I, I'd like to make a, a comment or an observation on this, uh, because it's kind of ironic that in the aftermath of 9-11 and the repatriation, so to speak, back to the Middle East of money, cash, capital that was in the Western banking system has had uh, the consequence of easing the financing of projects for state-owned companies in the Middle East because they have access to 
capital that doesn't scrutinize the return on capital in the same manner that uh, Western banking institutions do. And um, while projects may be risky in, a, in the sense that uh, risk perceived as more risky uh, in the way that Jim just articulated, there's a mitigating factor in that capital is there in a way that it wasn't before. That, of course, varies very much by the country. The classic combat is between the finance minister and the national oil company. In some countries, in effect, <clears throat> the, the finance ministry takes the money and then the national oil company has to come back hat in hand and request for it. Some countries, that's not true. And the point you make, Ed, is very, very true because with more money available for some of these national oil companies, in effect, you've got a better ability to invest. But it's not universal because it, it varies by the, by the government. Next line of questioning, Philippe. Well, I guess at this point, it, it becomes all related. <laughs> I'd like to, to, to make a follow-on comment of what, what James said earlier and then, and then ask the, the true question. The, the follow-up comment is talking about infrastructure and cost of infrastructure. I don't think we should make the mistake in modeling future requirements to limit those future requirements to the receiving terminal. If downstream from the receiving terminal, you do not have the adequate infrastructure to pick up dead gas and then move it around, it's useless. Uh, you may have a dream, or some of us may have a dream, to inject another BCF per day in the Boston market uh, because it's a good price, right? Well, two consequences. Number one, the good price would become a bad price. And second, I don't think that market has the physical capability to take that extra BCF. So I think, and it's true for the United States, that's true for Europe also. Um, what I found fascinating in getting back to Europe after 20 years of absence you, you hear of, about all the deregulation, liberalization of markets that is sponsored by the European Union. It's all very true. But all the EU is doing for the time being is to set up a set of rules that supersede what remains today national policies. France has its own. Uh, Germany has its own. Italy has its own. And to interconnect those systems into a truly open system is likely to take a few more generations of politicians, I'm afraid. Now, the question, and it's really a question I have to the audience. To your knowledge, is any of the large infrastructure projects that we use and operate today, has any of those been based on economics only? Isn't it that each and every of those major projects has been the result of a political decision? And if that is the case, how can we expect to have private enterprise and private enterprise only finance those $3 trillion of infrastructure without some form of support or some sort of political commitment that that money will be, will be protected to some extent? If that's the case, I think I, I love the effort so far, but it's an economics base model, the one that I've been using in my professional life for the last uh, uh, 15 or 20 years or so, for me what is a revelation of these two days, if you want, is that if, you, if we do not take the politics, including the geopolitics, into account, we may make the wrong choice every time. Does anyone want to comment? Uh, I, I actually so strongly disagree with the assumptions behind the original statement uh, that I want to comment on that because, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it doesn't take much uh, in the way of a retrospective analysis. So look, first of all, the market of the UK 15 years ago and compared to the market today, uh, if you were in the UK 15 years ago and you came back 15 years later, you would not recognize that market as being the same. If you look at the German or the Italian or the French markets, which have admittedly changed significantly less than uh, the UK market, uh, and extrapolate the same rate of change for the next three years as we've seen in the last three, the markets will be decidedly different when it comes to uh, the flow of the commodity, the participants in the market. Um, and uh, I think it will be uh, much shorter than uh, a fraction of any of our lifetimes before we see the European market more closely approximate those of uh, North America than was indicated in, in your comments. And I think it's a kind of fundamental strategic commercial an analytical mistake 
to assume that going into Europe three years from now will, will, will su surprisingly look like the rigidified uh, big participant invested interest market of, of a decade ago. Uh, let me clarify my comment, if I may, or my remark. I, I, I don't disagree with you. The UK today is, is a world apart from what it was 15 years ago. But 15 years ago, the infrastructure was in place. The major investments had been made at, at a different system. What we are seeing in the opening up of Europe today is, is similar. When, let me take an example. What I know of the development of natural gas in Belgium, it, it was a result of essentially two elements. One, the, the, the gas, the, uh, the Dutch gas reserves were very close, and it was fairly easy to connect the market to the source. Second, the oil shock of the 70s that caused a fundamental re political reflection and a political decision to diversify the, the primary energy supply in the country. That caused Zeebrugge to be built. Zeebrugge was a monster from an economics point of view. But nevertheless, once it was built, it is now allowed to become a, a market-based activity. My question is, that initial investment where the main, the, the big risk is taken because we, you don't really know where you're heading to, is it conceivable that we will be able, in a world, to, to do that without some level of protection? The, the Alaska pipeline, the, what do the oil companies ask for? They ask for the U.S. government to guarantee a minimum price, right? Does anyone want to comment on this issue of the role of the state? It could be called protection. It might have other words um, that could be applied. Briefly, though. Yes, yes, very brief. Uh, Wim Thomas uh, Schell. I think the role of the state becomes more and more important, uh, and it is uh, basically fueled basic by 9-11, I would say, where you have this, uh, a crisis of trust, uh, sorry, crisis of security. And that security also finds its way now in, um, in security of supply. And I think most of the policies also say, um, say in the US and the EU that um, energy security is connected now with foreign policy. So energy policy is connected with foreign policy. That's the point I'd like to make. Would others like to comment on this issue? No, I mean, I, I think the point is, um, uh, is unexceptional. And, um, you know, if, if the governments of the IEA do what they did in the late 1970s and say you cannot build an, a, a gas-fired power plant, that has enormous market implications. And if they say what they've said in the 1990s and this decade, uh, that you can't build anything except a, a natural gas-fired power plant, it too has an enormous implication. So, you know, the, the role of government, whether writ large the way Jim Barnes was speaking geopolitically or whether uh, it has to do with the, the, the rules of the game in terms of the use of, uh, of the commodity and the mechanisms for, uh, for, uh, the, for doing so, uh, you know, it's an unexceptional comment. Um, let's go to our next line of questioning, then I want to come back to this larger issue of, of geopolitics and what we mean by it. Michael Weston, Gas Strategies. Mine is a completely uh, different switch. Um, Jim made an excellent uh, presentation, as did Ed, but I do want to highlight uh, Jim's last comment. I'll assume he was being deliberately provocative. But, um, and, I and successful. Just, <laughs> and successful. And I will perhaps also assume there's somebody from the Boston Globe here. Um, the, the fact is that uh, if a plane were to crash into an LNG tanker in, the, in Boston, you would not have anything like Chernobyl. You will have a fire. You will have a large fire. The aviation fuel will go up, as, uh, as everybody has seen, unfortunately. But the uh, LNG is so cold that it takes a while for it to evaporate. And what you get is a slow evolution of the flame front. An LNG that will have escaped onto the water will evaporate through the heat of the water, and such that if it does not get caught up in the flame front, it will evaporate and disappear into the atmosphere, it being lighter than there. Contrast that with LPG, where you have a different problem. And by the way, LPG is usually under pressure. Um, so it is inherently very safe, and I think we in the industry have to really get our hands around that particular point, because it's a very, very important issue of safety. Just by way of illustration, years and years ago, uh, Shell, for whom I then worked, um, conducted an experiment where they dropped incendiary bombs, courtesy of the Royal Air Force, onto a tank of LNG. 
It took several incendiary bombs to get the damn thing to light. When once it lit, the flame front moved incredibly slowly, just like the move to my hand. And uh, it really was a very interesting experiment. And that is what you would get, and you would not get a Chernobyl. So please, Jim, don't use that again. I, I'm going to take that as a statement of fact. I think Jim was trying to say that the, that the political effect and the perception here was more like, uh, but I don't want to spend too much time on this issue. Jim, okay, let me just comment. First of all, I'm, with, I'm really with you. I mean, I believe that. The trouble is I mean, the, the LNG industry had a disaster at its onset back in 1944 when East Ohio Gas Company had a, a peak shaving plant in suburban Cleveland. They didn't understand the behavior of, low, of, high, of carbon steels at low temperatures. It ruptured. The LNG poured into a, the street sewers, blew up a residential area, and killed a lot of people. Since that time, the industry has done all kinds of safety work to prove that it's safe. The problem that's arisen now is that the threats that are perceived by the general public are outside the envelope of historic testing. And it seems to me it's very difficult to argue with these people who, I mean, there's some people out in California who have invented this scenario which says, okay, what you have is you have a rupture offshore, <clears throat> the, height, the LNG, the natural gas rises, as you'd expect. There's an inversion layer because in California that happens and creates smog. You have wind blowing in from the sea, and it mixes it all up, and boom, it goes boom. Now, how do you answer that? Very difficult. I, I had an interview, I mean, was interviewed by somebody from the Wall Street Journal on this safety issue the other day, and I said, you know, what the industry really ought to do is take an old tanker, fill it up with LNG, take it out, put it on television, and run a plane into it, or run a ship a la the USS Cole into it, and see what happens, and put it on public television. But until you do that, you've not tested outside the envelope that the public is sensitive to. It's not that I'd expect Chernobyl, but the public expects Chernobyl. So, I'd like to move on to a, a new subject. I think this exchange underscores that the industry still has a lot of work to do here beyond uh, uh, declaring and partly demonstrating the safety of the enterprise. I promised uh, Joe Barnes that we would come back to this larger question of what do we, what do we mean by geopolitics here? And I simply want to underscore that our thinking, I see Amy is next in line, so you are. Yeah. Then I'm going to shut up and let you answer Joe's okay. question. Uh, we saw geopolitics at work at the first five minutes of this conference, Joe, and that is because it's not necessary in Qatar's interest to announce at the beginning of this meeting that they would never be participate in, an, in a cartel. But I, who have been helping with the Qatar case study, can tell you that Qatar has had as its foreign policy since 1983 a courtship of the United States policy, which has culminated in the last year or two with very, very, very close relations between the Emir of Qatar and the United States government. And uh, the statement and the exhibition that we had here, which was very fun and sort of done in a very light spirit and humorous fashion, was really a very serious statement of foreign policy, kind of amazingly spontaneously introduced into our session on a topic that's never really actually been discussed. And what happened, in my opinion, was that the minister, who is a very smart man and very aware of his country's foreign policy and very involved in it, heard a person of the stature of James Baker throw this gas OPEC thing out in a remark, and he wanted to make it clear to James Baker that that's not where they were going, that they're an ally, that in the geopolitical context of their participation in the world, that they would not be interested in participating in a <laughs> gas cartel. And to me, that's really geopolitics, because that's about the United States protecting the security of Qatar as a country. <laughs> that's about Qatar being a major supplier of energy to Japan and having that be such an important supply to Japan that that gutter understands their relationship with the United States and they would never mess with the supply of Japan, right? That two-minute exchange that we all saw live was geopolitics live in the making for us here in the conference to understand the validity and the importance of this fuel. That it, and to me, really, where David and I came to for the idea of this study was that people think of gas as having domestic politics, but no geopolitics. We think of oil as having geopolitics. We think of gas as this neutral fuel 
that completely skims and bypasses the geopolitical system. And not only do I think that that probably was never quite true as the case studies brought out, but in the new world that the model shows, uh, it definitely, if the model is right, won't be true. And uh, especially if demand rises in places like China and China becomes extremely concerned about the security of their supply of gas and that forges a relationship between them and Russia, which the model is predicting. And in, uh, uh, some of those things, you know, have huge implications for the relationship among superpower nations, right, that really will have consequences that are more oil-like uh, in their geopolitics. So now I, I feel I've made my two-second pitch for uh, why this is a geopolitical study. Thank you very much. You've got to make it into a microphone, though. You've got to make it into a microphone. It's not a microphone. I, I, there. Think, I, I agree with it, and I think there's a great many working assumptions, and there actually are, I think, a great many geopolitical assumptions uh, that are many that, that are not very uh, well articulated that, that sort of float underneath uh, the study. Uh, one thing that I'd like to state is that the, the study, per se, and, and the whole approach uh, basically assumes a status quo, geopolitical status quo in the world, uh, specifically uh, American maritime dominance, which means that LNG can flow. I think that's a legitimate assumption, right, to prove on ships, but I think it might be useful to make it explicit that we're assuming that there is no naval challenge to the United States, a significant naval challenge in the next 30 years. It's a non-trivial question. Some people believe that China, for instance, may wish to launch such a challenge. That could have very, very serious and important consequences in East Asia. I don't think it is true. I don't think China is, but these are sort of issues that are very, very interesting and do have an impact on Qatar. My question is this, are the gutteries, did we hear the gutteries say yesterday, we are willing to accept less than the maximum amount of revenue for our gas in order to curry favor with the United States? And if so, what does it say about a strictly economic model? I, just, I thought we heard them say they're going to obey the laws of gravity. But uh, would the panelists like yeah, to Yeah, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, I think there is some, something very important about, uh, about, uh, about Joe's comments, uh, Amy's response, and your question, because uh, one of the things that is unfolding that you could speculate about, you particularly could speculate about, is uh, the world from a Russian perspective. We will have Russia being uh, the world's largest exporter of hydrocarbons. It will be unlike what it currently is, uh, which is a lumpy European supplier, a global supplier. It will have an interest in defining the rules of the game from its national interest perspective and not the interest perspective of, uh, uh, of the United States or the European Union. And I think um, I w you ought to be encouraged to speculate on what kind of world regime rules of flow uh, of this hydrocarbon would be ideal from a Russian perspective. It's a very important comment. I just want to add something that I know the modeling team will say, which is one of the very next things that's on the list to do is to do some more modeling work on this, especially because of this really interesting result where Russia could be playing this arbitrageur role both in the European markets and, and East. Jim, did you want to comment on this before yeah, we move to um, a new topic? James Ball first raised the question of what I guess he called micropolitics or something like that. I think, <clears throat> and it's a point well taken. Some of the things I was suggesting are not truly geopolitics in the pure sense of the word. My point is that if you're running a purely eco theoretical economic model, you cannot ignore those factors because they intervene in the schedule with which stuff comes online. <clears throat> but in talking about geopolitics, um, the comment was just made about we are assuming that the U.S. controls the seas. I had a discussion with somebody who's been negotiating with the Chinese, and I have no way of verifying this but he claims one of the big problems with the Chinese and LNG is that they don't like the fact that the U.S. Navy does control the seas. Yep. And the idea of going to the Middle East with the U.S. Navy between them and the Middle East is a concern. Now, that's yep. geopolitics in the purest sense. Not just gas. Hmm? Not just No, for just that gas. Area. But yeah. I mean, in Not sense, just for yeah. gas. It's no, for no, oil, too. Right. So that, in effect... Well, I mean... Well, yeah, well, okay, but I mean, in a sense, that's geopolitics, but it is, in our world is not necessarily their world, and it's going to influence the way that things shake out. So. Extremely good point. Are there other burning points on this issue, or are we going to switch to a new topic? On this topic? 
Uh, this is kind of specific. Uh, yesterday, Amy talked about uh, the all shocks of 1973 kind of sneaking up on us and saying that we need to look far into the future. Well, it occurs to me that one of the responses to the oil shock was the strategic oil storage, both in the United States and in Europe. Uh, and your scenarios call for Russia to become stronger and stronger, more and more and more important. And I don't think the Russians are going to forget in one generation their feeling of who they are and how they should be running things. And so is there at some point where somebody's going to say, wait a minute, we need to begin to build strategic storage of natural gas just in case somebody wants to get cute? Uh, has, have, how would you look at the storage capabilities in Europe and the costs and things of that nature, and at what point in the development 15 or 20 years from now would they begin to say, we have to bring in more and store it and, and add that to the cost of uh, a, a Russian supply source. Ed, I heard you say this was going to have to be dealt with on a regional basis. You want to comment more I mean, on let that? Me, let me comment briefly. Uh, our strategic petroleum reserve is stored in salt dumps. Now, in salt dumps happen to be a very expensive way to, to store gas, uh, not as expensive as liquefied natural gas in, in tanks. But <clears throat> if it is in the gaseous form, the ratio of liquid the gas is 600 to 1, so that the cost of store, strategic storage is exorbitant. And the idea of having a massive storage to, to handle significant interruptions in supply, I think, is probably unrealistic. I think so. Yeah. Ed, do you want to say something about this? No, I think, uh, James. I'm afraid this is my capacity point. And in gas, your security comes from diverse infrastructure capacity. Because the IEA taught us the way you deal with oil is begin, building lots of tanks in your own country, security on gas has been misstated as an issue of storage for too long. It's the security and diversity of capacity, which is why I completely agree with Jim's point about European Union, the, I mean, sorry, Ed made the point about being the buy, the buy side. When you liberalize as a market, you, ha you encourage diversity of infrastructure, which means that if one route is shut down, another one opens up. That's where the security comes from in gas. And as long as the energy policy people try to treat gas security like oil security, they'll get it wrong. And that's why it keeps saying, in, if you look at geopolitics, infrastructure is king. And it's infrastructure that is most heavily influenced by geopolitics in pipelines. And it is why, as uh, I can't remember which one of you pointed this out, it's why LNG has had such a success in the last few years. The world got geopolitically more complicated. LNG was an effective infrastructure alternative bypass the geopolitics of gas pipelines, and the pipeline people have had to respond to that by being more open and flexible and market friendly than they were inclined to be until LNG showed they could go around them. Very good point. Um, next, I don't see any other uh, burning comments on, on this issue. This is a new, new topic? Okay. Sort of counts as yes in my book. Okay. For, I'd like to make two brief uh, uh, comments on the technical comments on the model, and then I would like to make a comment on the interaction between uh, kind of the old commercial model, new commercial model, and geopolitics. Okay. The technical comments are as follows. I think your guys' uh, transportation costs are too high by 20 or 30 percent, and I bet that part of it comes from having a general rate of return in shipping and that as a practical matter, uh, shipping and LNG shipping in particular on charter basis is always paid off the top and has debt-like rates. And those are reflected in, in, in tariffs and, and so you ought to be at rates of return of 8% real or something like that. The second thing is, as far as I can tell, your model doesn't have liquid co-product production in supply. That is, you don't represent the fact that Guattari casts comes with 40 barrels of condensate per million cubic feet. Is that true? Well, let, let, me, let me just 
make the comment, 40 barrels per million, uh, per, uh, per thousand cubic, uh, per million cubic feet amounts at $25 a barrel to about a dollar per million BTU credit. At $40 a barrel, about a dollar 60. So at $25 a barrel, the FOB cost of service all in for Gulf gas is around a dollar to a dollar 20 not $2 to $2.20. The wetness of the gas is critical. We heard the Venezuela point, comment. Yeah, point, point made. Okay. Uh, now let me go on to the commercial uh, discussion. I'm really trying to amplify a point that James made. The, being careful about the definition of what's truly spot trades versus flexible trading under the context of a, of a larger uh, contract. Is, is important because it reveals the difference between the old model and new model. The old project model was designed to assure credit in the absence of markets, the restrictions placed on the buyer, uh, destination uh, restrictions, uh, limited uh, rigid take enormously costly and were only tolerable in a world where uh, the utility buyers didn't care about costs. In a world where uh, end use markets are competitive uh, and where costs are down, that model is, is creatively being destroyed and it's being replaced by a model in which the project isn't the seller, but the, but the sponsors become merchants. And in that world, which is much more flexible but still largely accommodated by a long-term contract structure, countries are less important. I think cartelization is less likely and uh, the use of LNG trading or gas trading for geopolitical purposes is less likely. So I think the commercial evolution, it's sort of the, the metaphor in my mind is, is a caterpillar being hidden by a chrysalis that's going to emerge as a, as a butterfly, which is merchant trading, often for the most part 70 or 80 or 90 percent under long-term contracts, but contracts which flexibly allow the allocation of rents a priori to opportunistic trading. Uh, is going to be the world we see, and that's going to be a more competitive and more commercial world. Does anyone want to comment on whether it's easier or harder to cartelize butterflies uh, as, instead of uh, caterpillars? I think it's a very, very important point about the changing role of the state here and the impact of that on, uh, on cartel formation and echoes a conversation we had yesterday afternoon. Jim, do you want to talk about this or say anything? Um, I'm not sure I disagree with you. Okay. I, yeah. Ken? I want to respond to the question. Um, the richness of the gas stream regionally is accounted for in the model. Uh, in particular, there are processing links within the model that actually strip out um, um, the liquids, if you will. Uh, now, an explicit modeling of a liquid market is not something we have taken, taken, account, in a, uh, taken account of just yet, but it is something that we're moving toward. So, I mean, point well taken, and it's something that we are aware of. Are there other major lines that the organizers of this conference have read me the riot act about being an efficient uh, chairman here? So are there other major lines of uh, inquiry uh, before I bring our last line of inquiry right here? I'm not, I'm not sure if this is a major line of inquiry. My name is Mark Mack from Schlumberger, and just in seeing the course of the last two days and the geopolitics question, first of all, to answer your question, the third rule of politics, he who has the gold makes the rules. Um, but I think what I've seen a lot of is the assumption that the U.S. is a free market and sort of, if you like, benevolent in this. And I think there's far more influence than we realize. Just three examples that we heard even today, the U.S. role in sanctions against the Soviet Union earlier, um, Iraq going from a stable but repressive state to a failed state, and then the sort of side effect of the um, banking rules after 9-11 of capital flowing back to the Middle East. And I would just say that in the model, the extreme influence of the U.S., which it appeared to me is maybe underweighted or underemphasized in what's been done so far. Just a comment. Okay, thank you. Are there major points of Otis? Otis Bird with Halliburton. I just wanted to make a comment on the modeling. And, Jim, I liked your uh, comment where we need to step back and close one eye and look at the data. Uh, when I look at what we're doing in the modeling, whether it be here or MPC study, is I think we focus with one eye on the modeling, and we probably need to step back and open both eyes and see what's coming in from the side. There's coal and there's nuclear out there, and probably while we're trying to solve the 
energy problem with natural gas. There's probably meetings going on just like this in the coal industry and the nuclear industry, and we probably need to pull them into the picture if we're really going to look at the energy problem and say, what are their solutions? The DOE spends 10 times as much money on coal research as it does on oil and gas research, and there may be something coming out there that uh, we really need to take into account and not assume that natural gas is going to be the solution. And if we're doing that, I'd like to know what we're doing. Yeah. member of the Energy Forum. We actually have an extension project that we were going to pitch, right, um, that is to integrate competition of fuels. We were thinking oil and coal uh, into the model, and we know how we would do it. Uh, but we could look at nuclear. We don't know as much about nuclear. We might, you, somebody will have to come to us and give us a lesson, but uh, we could look at it. Actually, we do know nuclear because we did the study for TEPCO. Mm -hmm. Ken, why don't you comment on that study? Uh, uh, well, not to comment on the study too much because we are limited on time here, but um, the integration of all the fossil fuels incorporated into that is actually an integration of the power market worldwide as well because we want to also be able to investigate the idea that we can transmit power rather than fossil fuels across great distances via new technologies such as HPDC going into the future. So, well, I think if this you is look a very at nuclear production of electricity in the U.S., it's, it's grown every year while we've closed 17 reactors, it continues to grow on how much electricity we produce with the nuclear. I think this is a very important point to close a meeting on gas to remind us not to have tunnel vision about gas because um, we're talking about, at the end of the day, services, energy services, and gas isn't the only game in town. Um, let me also take this opportunity, uh, having the floor um, as I do, to thank a very large number of people and organizations who have been uh, helpful, uh, more than helpful in this, uh, both the, the sponsors of the conference and the study um, that have been thanked several times and the sponsors of the Energy Forum here at the Baker Institute. Um, this is a collaborative enterprise, as you have seen, uh, not only a collaboration between Stanford and Rice University, but also a collaboration with a larger group of scholars and reviewers people in industry, people in other uh, universities and institutions, uh, and this would simply be impossible without their, uh, their feedback and their central participation all along the way. This is an amazingly organized uh, uh, conference, and I can say that as somebody really arriving from the outside, because not only is it this is a beautiful hall and a very comfortable setting and a wonderful dinner we had last night, but there's an extraordinary infrastructure that goes on behind this that makes it all happen. It's, it's a, electronically, I guess it's all live on the web, so you can go back and uh, replay your, see yourself. Um, uh, presentations are available, papers are available, and hard copy on the web. It's, it's, it's an extraordinary uh, um, work that has gone on here, really especially at the Baker Institute, and I want to thank the Baker Institute and their staff, in particular Molly Hip and her staff, uh, the Energy Forum, uh, uh, Jalene Connors, and the other members of the Energy Forum here who have made all of this, uh, this, this happen, uh, Secretary Baker and Ambassador Deregian. And I want to give a special thank you to my collaborator, Amy Jaffe. Uh, we have spent a year and a half, two years together working on this, and we still have uh, quite a lot of work to do, uh, but we are enormously grateful for all of your participation. Uh, and with that, I draw the meeting to a close.